Hello, and welcome to part four of our series of lectures on the nervous tissues. And in this mini lecture, we're going to take a look at uh, peripheral nerves. Now, what we focused in on um, the first three mini lectures are primarily uh, what's found with the cell bodies, where the cell bodies are going to be located. Uh, we've talked about some of the support cells within the central nervous system. Um, but basically, we, we've talked about specialized structures. When we take a look at histo histological specimens, what we're looking at primarily are going to be organs and tissues of the body. Uh, unless we're looking at the brain or the spinal cord, we're going to be looking at uh, the structures of the body, the organs of the body. Uh, they're going to be innervated. They're going to receive nerve processes. Uh, but the processes we look at are going to be peripheral nerves. And so we need to focus in on that at this point. And so a gross anatomical peripheral nerve, kind of the named nerves that go out through the body, and then branches of those named nerves as they get finer and finer and make connections with their specific targets, are in essence going to be bundles of nerve fibers. And this is a fancy way of saying that we're looking at bundles of axons. So we're looking at those cellular processes that are going to go out and make contact with the periphery, make contact with a muscle cell if we're looking at a motor cell, or make contact with a sensory receptor if we're looking at a sensory uh, neuron axon. These nerve fibers or nerve axons may be myelinated or unmyelinated. We'll talk about what myelin is uh, in the next mini lecture, but it is essentially kind of wrapping around uh, these axons to help it uh, transmit signals within the, the body. And in general, the peripheral nerves outside of the myelin uh, sheath, the myelin protective coating, are going to be held together by connective tissue, again, as a, a coherent structure within the body. Now, within the peripheral nervous system, we're going to have support cells, similar to the glial cells that we had within the central nervous system. And these support cells in the peripheral nervous system we refer to as swan cells. Uh, these swan cells are going to be, uh, in many cases, difficult to identify except for the fact that we're going to see them associated with this wavy pattern of uh, peripheral nerves and the axons that they're supporting. We look at what we can see of these cells, we're going to see that they're going to have kind of ovoid or flattened nuclei, which is going to be peripheral to the axon. And by definition, we're going to use this as um, an identifying characteristic of the swan cells. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the other thing that these nuclei could be associated with are going to be fibroblasts. Swan cells are going to be the support cells within the peripheral nervous system. Fibroblasts are going to be essentially the connective tissue cells providing the connective tissue covering for the structure. So in general, the fibroblast nuclei are going to tend to be uh, very um, heterochromatic. They're going to be darker staining and more flattened where the swan cell nuclei are going to tend to be more ovoid and more euchromatic, kind of paler staining uh, when you take a look at it. You're also going to see the swan cell nuclei towards the, the core of a peripheral nerve, the fibroblast, and the, the connective tissue regions around the nerve. Now we said that one of the important characteristics associated with the swan cells it is going to be producing myelin. And so if we take a look at what it is that is this myelin, this is going to be very similar whether we're talking about the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system, is it's basically the support cells, in this case the swan cells, the peripheral nerve, but it would be the oligodendrocytes within the central nervous system, are basically going to take their plasma membrane and almost like you're rolling up um, a, a, a tube of toothpaste, is you're going to roll up the plasma membrane around the axon. So what you end up with are many layers of these phospholipids uh, that are going to be packed on top of one another. So in cross-section, uh, we can take a look at it on the right-hand side, electron microscopy at the top, you can see multiple layers of the plasma membrane, multiple layers of that phospholipid bilayer. In the hematoxin and eosin stain section, the cross-sections uh, on the bottom half of that slide, you can see that it has a pale staining appearance because the fats are washed out. Uh, the phospholipids and the fats are washed out when we're processing the tissues. 
So what we're going to have with this myelin then is that many, many layers of this plasma membrane of the supporting cell wrapped around the axon. And it's going to be important for the functioning of the axon itself. Now, there are going to be gaps between a myelin sheath or a myelin covering within one region or one segment of an axon in the next. And these gaps can be seen in a longitudinal specimen where you can see it running kind of lengthwise. Um, and they're going to be referred to as nodes of Ranvier. Again, you'll be able to see this in electron microscopy, uh, but probably not under a normal uh, hematoxylin and eosin stained light microscopy specimen. Now, if we take a look at the structure of myelin, the major component is going to be the phospholipid bilayer, but we're going to have a variety of proteins. In the peripheral nerve, we're going to have myelin basic, uh, myelin basic protein, uh, protein zero, which are essentially going to be involved with anchoring these layers of phospholipid to one another. Uh, the idea is that we're going to squeeze out the cytoplasm so that what we're going to have between is relatively limited. And so we're essentially going to keep these layers attached to the overlying layer, attached to that next overlying layer, so there's not a lot of space between them. And so we're going to form a nice insulating uh, region. Uh, so these proteins are going to be present to anchor the lipids, uh, anchor the phospholipid bilayer, anchor the, uh, the plasma membrane to the underlying layer of plasma membrane uh, so they can hold them very tight to one another. Now, if we take a look at this in a myelinated axon, what we're going to have, and we'll see, get an electron micrograph of it. So we've got the axon to the center. We can see a mitochondria. And then we can see layer upon layer upon layer of the swan cell membrane that's been wrapped around. And then we can actually see um, a little bit of cytoplasm of the, uh, the swan cell that's surrounding it at that outermost layer. And so essentially within the myelin, we're squeezing out the cytoplasm, um, but the cell is going to remain alive, and so we can see some cytoplasm kind of outside of that. Many swan cells are going to be involved with uh, surrounding and supporting one of these axons because each swan cell is going to be involved with a relatively short segment. Again, gaps between one swan cell and the next, gaps between one myelinated region and the next, are going to be the nodes of Ranvier. And the important thing to recognize is that this myelin is going to be important because it's going to allow these axons to send more uh, rapid, much faster uh, electrical signals, neuronal signals uh, within the nervous system. Now, in addition to the myelinated axons, the very fast axons, we can also have unmyelinated axons. And basically what happens with an unmyelinated axon is you have a swan cell that just kind of surrounds and supports kind of a cluster of axons. And so that's what we've got on the electron micrograph to the right. You can see the, the swan cell that's going to be sitting there. Uh, we can see a, a myelinated axon kind of towards the top. But to the bottom where we got that U kind of at the center, we've got a structure where we've got probably, you know, six or ten uh, myelin, um, unmyelinated axons, which are all going to be surrounded and supported by a single swan cell. Again, keep in mind that that one swan cell, even though it's supporting multiple axons, is only involved with supporting a short segment along each of those axons. So we'll have many swan cells along the axons, whether we're talking about myelinated or unmyelinated. Now, if we take a look at the functioning of the myelin, uh, we said that it was important for rapidly sending signals within the body. And so if we take a look at something like multiple sclerosis uh, as an example of a demyelinating disease, we are essentially, in this case, looking at myelin within the central nervous system, looking at a lesion within the white matter, looking at a lesion within the axon tracts, and it's associated with what are described as neurological dysfunction. What happens is you damage uh, the myelin, you're going to have inflammatory cells that are going to be coming in to respond to that damage. So you may have microglia coming in. You may have other cells coming in to uh, respond to this inflammation. And it often results in astrocytic scars or astrocytic plaques. The overall effect, though, is that it's going to disrupt the ability of that nerve cell to send a signal. And so if you take a look at the, the bottom of the diagram on the right-hand side, you see under normal, each of those little blips uh, represents an action potential. In multiple sclerosis, we've got fewer blips coming through and they're spaced further apart. And so they're sending fewer signals, slower signals, 
uh, less information is being able to be transmitted because we've disrupted the myelin sheath. Now, outside of the myelin, we're still going to have connective tissue, which is going to be involved with holding the nerve as an anatomical structure together. And so immediately outside these swan cells, either it's unmyelinated or a myelinating uh, swan cell, these swan cells are going to be held together with an endoneurium. Endo for kind of inside, nerve for neurium for inside the nerve. What we're going to have is going to be a relatively delicate um, three-dimensional matrix of, of collagen fibers, relatively thin fibers, relatively delicate fibers, uh, which are going to be able to hold the structure together. A few fibroblasts are going to be present, but the majority of the cells, the majority of the nuclei that are going to be present within this region are going to be the swan cells. Uh, occasionally, uh, some fibroblasts within the region, but they're going to be very, very rare. Um, it's generally thought that the swan cells are going to be involved with helping to support and maintain the endoneurium. Outside of that, we're going to have the perineurium perineurium for around the nerve, where we're going to have a more cellular connective tissue sheath. And in this case, it's going to be a distinct uh, region of connective tissue. Um, you're still going to have, um, in this case, many more uh, fibroblasts, um, but they're not always going to be as apparent. Uh, but you're going to have a distinct connective tissue region, which is going to be surrounding and establishing a region of a nerve. So you've got the, the nerve on the, the diagram on the right hand side. You can see the kind of wavy pattern for the nerve. You can see some uh, cross-sectional profiles, the circular profiles in there. Again, because the nerve is going to have a very, very wavy appearance. And you can see some connective tissue around the outside. And again, this is where we're going to have more distinct connective tissue of the perineurium. You're going to have small blood vessels coming into this region and identifying this as kind of an anatomical structure. And then outside of that, we're going to have an epineurium. And in the epineurium, what we're going to have is going to be the outermost layer around a nerve. And in many cases, this is going to be when you get to the point of a, a more kind of named type nerve structure uh, or a larger nerve, where essentially what you're going to have is multiple bundles, which are going to be surrounded and supported by a denser connective tissue. And so you're going to find um, lots of collagen, lots of fibroblasts within this area, and larger blood vessels that are going to be present there. And so endoneurium, very fine connective tissue, probably produced by the swan cells. we got the perineurium, which is going to form a, a cluster or a bundle of these axons within a nerve. And then the epineurium, kind of the outermost uh, surrounding layer of dense connective tissue, holding generally more than one of these perineurial bundles together. And that's going to finish up our discussion of the kind of anatomical organization of the peripheral nerves. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.